Okay, well, thank you everyone for making it all the way to the final panel. We have two presentations today on a topic that is near and dear to every interior Alaskan's heart, and that's the Chena Town site. Uh, before I introduce the presenters, I guess I have to give everyone the Zoom rules and regulations. Uh, the Q&A session will be saved until the end of the two presentations. If you have questions during the presentation, feel free to put them in the chat box to everyone, and we will read them to the presenters during the Q&A. If you would rather ask your question out loud at the end of the presentations, use the raise your hand function and we will unmute you to ask the question. And because we only have two panelists, there should be plenty of time for questions. And for those of you that joined early, you already know this, we're not talking about the bus, even though we have people uh, from the Museum of the North on the panel. Um, so our, our first presenter uh, will be by Josh Ruther, who is presenting for Martin Gutowski, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Josh is an archaeologist with a strong emphasis on archaeological sciences and geosciences. He values interdisciplinary research within archaeology and anthropology and working across traditionally non-archaeological and non-anthropological frameworks. He has spent several years working for a private cultural resource management firm in Alaska before joining the University of Alaska Fairbanks Anthropology Faculty. Uh, this presentation is titled, Digging for the Lost Town of China. And I'll let you take it away, Josh. Okay, let me just share here. Um, yeah, so like Martin, or uh, Eric said, Martin couldn't be here today. So I'm sort of giving a hybrid of, of Martin's talk and, um, a little bit of my flavor that I've added to Martin's talk. And Martin was the director of the Tanana Valley Railroad for a long time. Um, and also he was a surveyor for the borough for uh, 30 years and grew up around here. He was a student at one time here. Um, so he has a wealth of information on, on China and the railroad and um, my involvement in this project with Martin and others that you'll see me mention goes back to about nearly 10 or 15 years. And uh, this is sort of uh, part of Martin's, uh, you know, talk, talks that he gives on uh, China. And one of the things that we get uh, within the community is uh, what is China or where is China? And this comes up quite a bit. Um, and frequently we'll get sort of this question, where the hell is China or what was China? And so we sort of do these um, sort of outreach uh, um, presentations and we're trying to get kiosks out at China, helping the, the park uh, get some out there and really just sort of uh, reframing a history of China basically in and of itself uh, beside the competition with Fairbanks. And here's sort of a picture of what China looked like in 1905, sort of the short lived um, China town site. Now, I want to mention that it's the China town site and not China village, which was up or uh, a little bit down drainage, uh, which is the Diné village uh, before this time and during this time. So when I refer to China in this, it'll be in reference to the town site itself. And you can see here sort of a 1904 map in relation to China uh, or in relation to Fairbanks and also um, so some of the winter trails. And also if you look down at the um, trading post that was actually established before China and uh, Hedrickson, Hedrickson belts uh, moving actually that trading post over to China, which is one of the impetuses of, of the buildup of the China town site. And here's sort of the view today. Uh, this is um, Melissa from the, the Historic Preservation and, uh, Commission in the borough. And it's actually taken from a, an area, you'll see this a couple times, these uh, sort of photos, it's taken from a site, an, an area of a house that a old photo from 19, uh, uh, I think 05 or 06 was taken from this exact spot. And you can sort of see UAF in the back. But this is actually China down in these flats, and it's a wayside now. Uh, so we actually have a boat launch out there, and we it's a uh, it's 
it's actually administered by the uh, state parks. And so we've been able to go down there and do some work that um, Scott will talk about uh, with you uh, just after this for archaeology and mapping. And so just a brief, uh, a brief uh, history on China in that it was really the trading post was moved o o over to the other side of the bank from the island in 1901. And it was incorporated in 1903. The post office was established in 1904. And um, the right of way, which is key, was in 1906. So we did we had the railroad going down there, but that was sort of once the railroad was actually removed in 1920. Uh, you can see in 1921 that effectively the town site was canceled, and you can actually see that on maps. That progression as we go through maps. Uh, one of the things that we've been that Martin has been keen on is actually getting these historic survey plats and the insurance maps so we can actually map out China in uh, in a finer grain manner with survey equipment and actually trying to get on the ground and actually plotting the roads as you'll see is one of our endeavors or where the roads once were in relation to old historic foundations and um, and privy pits, things like that. <clears throat> um, I put on here um, Baker and McCormick's, um, how they actually talk about China in 1906, and then also Orse uh, 1967 depiction of what China was. And it was called different things like China City or China Junction, or just China. And you can see basically, through the growth of uh, China around 1920 it was down to at least uh, it was around 18 people or less so it was very short-lived its heyday was probably between 1904 and 1911 as you'll see with um, some of Scott's data that we're getting with the archaeology um, this is sort of uh, from Terence's book uh, Terence Cole's book Crooked Pass uh, you know, some of you might actually know the book is the its first title, E.T. Barnett, The Strange Story of a Man Who Founded uh, Fairbanks. And um, this is sort of one of the things that China's history gets depicted as is basically the competi competition between Fairbanks and China and this sort of bitterness and this rival political rival rivalry. And this is sort of how China's history has been depicted uh, for the most part. And so we're through this sort of project is we're trying to actually bring about a little bit of the history of China in relation to just China itself and not necessarily in the context of what was an important competition in the, its history, but it sort of takes over the life of the history of China in a way and how we talk about China. Um, and you can see a, um, one of the depictions of China, the, the log bridge that goes from one uh, over the Ross Slough there. Uh, this is also from Nasky's, uh, Nasky and Slotnick's book, uh, The Alaska History of the 49th State. And this is also something that we sort of grappled with is not only the competition of China, but what happened to China after, not only just people moving out, but what physically remained. And, this is this quote uh, from Nasky is sort of a depiction of when we before we started this project, a lot of people uh, basically pointed out to us that it most of it's washed away. So one of our questions was, okay, how much is still there? How much of the remnants are still there from a historic preservation point of view and an archaeological point of view? And that sort of gets into our work with the parks and also um, you know the uh, uh, DNR and trying to actually figure out what's on the ground and what's intact and what's not disturbed. So we can make management decisions as Scott will talk about uh, when there's actually um, some development out at the wayside. And so here's sort of a relation again of um, a 1920s uh, map uh, with Fairbanks and College in China. And you can actually see in 1920, the stamp of the government town site withdrawal. So by 1920 maps were actually showing that there is a withdrawal 
of the uh, basically the railroad there or the a right of way at that point in 1921 to 1920 to 1921 the railroad bed was actually taking parts of that going down to Ninana, other parts of it going other places. And you can see this pro progression also within uh, from 1913 or 1913 China here and then also to abandon on maps in 1933 and then really not even showing a town site but just putting the name China there in 1948. So this is really qu quick uh, history even uh, just on visuals of maps and even uh, depictions in photographs. And through the photographs, we've been able to look at things like how that progression has, has um, built up from the first photographs in China. I think the first one that we have that we think is China is actually in 1903. I didn't put it on here. It was one that we just got, I think, from um, one of Terence Cole's archives that he found. Um, and but here's 1905 and it's a quick build up like any boom bus town and it develops and you start to see buildings actually being lost in a few of these when you actually look at high resolution we have a few up into about 1913 to 1915 uh, we have a couple from 1920 but after 1920 our visual part of this sort of gets lost so we're trying to find um, things between 1920 and 1960 on what's actually going on uh, at this area and in the landscape. And one of the, again, one of the things that we've grappled with is how much is actually washed away by the river. And that sort of comes from not only Martin's surveying point of view is, uh, you know, what can we map uh, within, within even a few hundred feet of what exists, but also what can we see archaeologically and can we use the archaeological record to actually uh, inform the mapping, which is what Scott will talk about. Um, here's a couple of depictions I wanted to show you of Bob Henze's work. Bob works for U.S. Fish and Wildlife and he's been doing a lot of work on changes in the slough um, and also uh, the Chena River and parts of um, the Tanana. And he had, had this great presentation on the uh, summer ser session series a little while back and you can see it on YouTube. They have those actually on YouTube. And this is from his 2019 presentation and he actually gave me an updated um, aerial uh, to, or a couple days ago. But here's 1938 and you can see the town site right over here. You can actually see some of the uh, roads on it. And there's the town site there and there's sort of a, a um, the aerial blown up and you can actually see part of that map you can see parts of the vegetation, things like that around the roads. So we can overlay that uh, town site map. But then you actually see the changes in the river and washing away uh, at least by 1967. And a big part of that town site uh, actually being eroded and washed away. You can also see on this map the area of the wayside or the potential for the wayside and um, how that's actually developed. Uh, prior to this, there was actually mentions of a community garden in the 50s uh, being down there. So there's been a lot of, of sort of disturbances to the town site. And so that's what we're also sort of grappling with, with the archaeology and the mapping is how much has been, uh, has been disturbed versus what's intact. Um, and then here's 1978. So you can actually see parts of um, sedimentation actually happening in the area of the, the town site. So it's been washed away and then sediment has actually been pushed back in with the river. So we actually have areas where we have land, but it's not the original, uh, it's not the original part of the floodplain that China town site was once laying on. So that's another question that we're grappling with. And here's actually uh, 2000, uh, 21 uh, depiction of it with the 1938 part of the map um, on it. Um, okay, there's a. And so Martin has been doing a lot in the archives uh, with um, trying to find a lot of maps that would help us actually find things on the ground and actually identify any sort of intact um, 
um, remnants of China, so either privies or foundations, are they warehouses, are they residential? And he's been working with the Sanborn map and, and he's been working with other surveyors and GIS specialists to actually georectify this on a geographic information system. And so we can actually overlay it and start to work on what are we actually finding in, um, uh, in real time in the field work and this has been a, a great way for archaeologists to actually uh, work on sort of frameworks for looking at town sites and differences in warehouse or residential areas. And you can see sort of uh, one I idea that in the past is that it was totally buried in underground in the campground. And so when you actually look at the maps from 1950s to 1960s and 70s, um, that's basically the depiction is basically the campground and the boat ramp over the, the town site. And sort of here's that, that photograph that I mentioned where Melissa was at. This is actually the um, up to date or the now photograph and here's the past photograph. So you can see how this was actually covered with buildings and uh, even like animal pens and things like that on part of it and warehouses and things like that. So, our question was, could we even find some of this stuff on the ground anymore if it's been washed away or if it's been covered up? And, and that's sort of where we came about it in around 2010, nine or 10. And this was actually, a, um, it started with an interview that Bob Betts and Pete Bowers did uh, with Nilo Kopanen in 2004 and five, where Nilo basically went down with, um, with uh, uh, Pete and, and Bob and, and started working with him on what he remembers of uh, being at the town site in the, when he was out there in the 1950s and on until uh, he actually passed away. And so that was actually a, a great wealth of knowledge there that we could use oral histories and then also maps and finer grain maps of the Platts, the Sanborn maps, the railroad maps. Um, and so that's actually helping us with figuring out where we're actually finding uh, intact structures and things like that versus where they are, hopefully with the streets. And again, Scott will, will talk about that a little bit more. And the um, survey maps that were, when it became canceled, these maps actually uh, just became almost defunct from a survey's point of view at the time. But as Martin has uncovered these, we can actually find uh, some of these areas that we can uh, use the survey markers from the past to actually uh, use in our studies is trying to actually uh, figure out where we are uh, within that plat as we find archaeology and, uh, and also uh, try to map the roads. And we've been using LIDAR also to map some of this. So this is basically fine grained topography that we're getting. Uh, from LIDAR and our hope is, is that we can actually see some of the uh, disturbances or even the features as we start to get the LIDAR changing into a higher resolution for the topography. So uh, almost to like sub-meter topography in a way is what we're hoping for in the future. Um, and you can see how it's sort of changed the, the resolution between 2010 and 2017. And so this is actually helping us map some uh, features that we wouldn't normally see on the ground per se, as we're out there. Um, and we've been using GPS and GIS. Uh, this is Charlie Parr when he was a student, he has, uh, he has graduated and moved on, but we can really use uh, high precision GPS to sort of locate things and try to map things where we are in relation to those historic maps and also just the river, what the river was washing away versus what it actually, uh, we gained through um, sedimentation at times. Uh, so Charlie and other surveyors that we're working with um, has, have been crucial in this sort of effort of um, remapping things at China. And we've been using uh, GPR and magnetometer to try and get uh, sort of uh, identify subsurface anomalies. Uh, Northern Land Use Research with Pete Bowers and Robert Bowman and, and myself when I was there and also Bill Witte when he was at, at, uh, or at the borough. Uh, so we went out and actually mapped these things and we could, we, here we were actually trying to tie in the old railroad bed 
and see if there were any anomalies that we could actually figure out if there were any um, sort of um, anomalies from the ground penetrating radar. And we actually picked up an old feature here, which uh, Scott will talk about as a foundation. And this is sort of, um, there was an archeology span report in 2004 that we could actually key off from, uh, even though there wasn't a ton of information, we could use it to guide us a little bit um, in our, our studies with this uh, geophysical um, uh, techniques. And that sort of led us to understanding this feature here, which is a foundation. And this is sort of what the GPRR looks like when you're looking at it, actually a, a subsurface profile. And you can kind of see this, uh, this foundation actually cut into uh, the stratigraphy. This is actually the old surface of Chena Town site and that's cut into the uh, floodplain sediments. And that's actually a, a log foundation there. So we could use this GPR to actually key us into things that we couldn't necessarily see on the ground. Uh, with uh, all of the vegetation uh, in front of us. So this could key us into a lot of different things. And here's sort of actually a 3D depiction of it uh, in a larger fence diagram. And here's sort of what it would look like in a 3D sense uh, when we start actually mapping out the anomalies. And you can see these, these areas of the foundation that we're actually picking up. So we can see how big it is also when we wanna uh, test these things. Um, and so, the questions that we're really working on, and, and Martin has been trying to work on this for a while, even before I got started 15 years ago, was how much of this did, did wash away? And we're actually starting to, to see most of the front street is probably washed away or the, in the dock area, but we have a large po portion of the town site that's still intact. And the question is, um, how intact is it with later disturbances like the uh, like the wayside or sort of this garden, um, this community garden that we have sort of anecdotes um, uh, de it developing in the 1950s. So that's sort of where we're at. And that's where Scott will uh, uh, start talking about the archeology span and how that informs our work. Great. Thank you, Josh, and thank you uh, for stepping in for Martin to, mm -hmm. to, sh to show us where the hell China is. Yeah, um, no problem. Um, uh, questions for Josh uh, will, will be addressed uh, at the end of the second presentation. Um, and the second presenter is um, Scott Shire. Um, Scott has lived in the interior Alaska for the, almost 20 years and received a graduate degree in anthropology from UAF. He has worked at the Museum of the North since 2008 and is currently the archaeology collection manager. And his presentation is called Historic Archaeology at the, uh, the Chena Town Site. So I'll let you take it away, Scott. All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, let me just get my slideshow started here. One second. All right, how is that showing up? Yep, looks good. Okay, great. Um, all right, well, thanks, Eric, for that introduction. And thanks, Josh, again, for um, taking over and covering Martin's presentation and for that great background on kind of the history of China and a, um, Sort of the beginning of this this project that we've um, that we've been involved with, but that also lots of people have gotten started prior to us in the past. So, just like Josh, I came into this um, after other folks had already gotten started working on it. And as I'll talk about, um, 2014 is really when I first started getting involved when we started breaking ground with the archaeology um, out at the site. So today, that's what I'm going to be focusing on is the historic archaeology that's been accomplished at China over the last 20 years or so, um, starting in 2002, as Josh had alluded to, um, and then since then uh, has been led by various individuals at different times. Um, my slides aren't advancing for some reason. Let me 
shoot, just give me a second. Sorry, folks, we tried, tested this out prior and everything seemed to be working. Um, just give yeah, me we a had moment. that problem the other day. Uh, yeah, I think started over again. And, okay, uh, I'll, I'll give that a shot here. Um, and I think the using the return enter button instead of the arrows maybe to advance them. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, let me try to share screen again here. Okay, is that cycling for everyone now? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Sorry about that. So as Josh mentioned, the main concentration of the, the commercial district for China townsite overlaps with uh, the inside the boundaries of what today is the China Pump Wayside, um, administered by the Alaska Division of Parks and Outdoor Recreation. Um, and prior to archeology span inventory in 2002, which I'll talk more about here in a minute, which was conducted by the Alaska Office of History and Archaeology. The widespread assumption uh, persistent throughout Fairbanks was that the, the town site was, um, that little was left of intact features uh, relating to the town site were still existing within the boundaries of that wayside, um, thinking that most of them had been destroyed through um, erosion by the Tanana River. Um, and this is just a quick overview map, um, kind of, um, showing you in the red rectangle, the, the location of the wayside and the, and the town site. And this next slide here, just the current Google Earth image of it, um, showing the wayside, including the, a large parking area, um, sort of the looping road around. And then in the, in the kind of lower left is the, the boat ramp there right along the bank of the river. So archeological survey and limited subsurface testing was conducted by um, OHA in 2002, which revealed potentially preserved intact features um, and artifact assemblages, uh, which resulted in a published report by Thompson and Pendleton um, in 2004. And so this field work was completed as compliance work by the state uh, for Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act relating to any potential construction projects related to the wayside. Um, that could happen in the future and uh, potentially have negative impacts on those on those historic features. So during that work, they recorded 48 historic features along with isolated artifacts at the site. And then they also hypothesized a function for each of those features based on the surface expression they were seeing of, of what was left of those, of those features. Um, so Thompson and Pendleton's, their functional interpretations of features included building foundations, root cellars, privies, and then just depressions with, with an unknown function. So based on the 2002 field work, um, the site is considered eligible for the National Historic, um, National Register of Historic Places as an archeological district, but as of yet, it's not, has not been formally nominated as such. So it's not on the list yet. Um, and then as Josh alluded to, um, since 2004, Josh talked about quite a bit, um, since 2004, a GIS and GPS and total station mapping program um, developed as a collaboration between the, the Fairbanks North Star Borough, um, largely led by Martin and then Northern Land Use Research as well with Pete Bowers and um, Josh was working with them at the time. Um, so work happened since 04 up through, um, up there, you can see this map was made in, in 2014. This is one that I um, stole from a report by Northern Land Use um, back, at, back during that time period. But so in NLUR, Northern Land Use Research, they um, so the work they started really was um, trying to figure out what portions of the town still existed, um, relying on, on um, Thompson and Pendleton's work within which, which of those portions of the site could potentially be matched up to structures on historic maps and photographs. Uh, but then they also conducted the ground penetrating radar surveys that Josh talked about within the main portion of the site, which is, um, it's in the way on here. So it's just back in this green area, um, back in kind of the north, northwest corner of, of the wayside in areas that are still undisturbed. Um, 
So the GPR survey identified uh, four subsurface anomalies, two of which were identified as um, surface features J and U by Thompson and Pendleton, and then two others, um, which NLUR called anomalies three and four that were previously unrecorded um, and don't appear to have any surface expression, so they're completely buried. So with the help of NLUR, we also ran another GPR survey in 2014 in a different portion of the site. Um, and I'll talk about that again, um, more here in a moment. Shoot, now my slides aren't advancing. It's really weird. Why is that happening? You try the return or the... Huh. Yeah, I was trying to, I was just using my the cursor arrow keys on there. Yeah, that should work too. Um... Oh, there we go. I've, I've used the buttons on the screen. That's working. So, all right. Sorry again about that. So um, in July of 2014, and this is when I really first got involved um, with work out at the site. Um, so we were granted a program that year to start larger scale archaeological testing of features at the site. And that year we had a crew of mostly high school students and we ran it as a field school through a program at UAF called the Alaska Summer Research Academy. Um, which was a two week intensive science based summer camp. So prior to us heading out into the field that year, we outlined four specific research goals that we wanted to accomplish with, with the limited testing that we were gonna do. And I'll just run through those here quickly. So the first was to associate the identified archeological features um, with known structures on historic maps and photographs. Um, Two, we wanted to conduct more GPR survey to and guess, um, investigate site formation processes but also identify additional subsurface features at the site um, that maybe had not been identified yet. Uh, three, we wanted to excavate features and use archeological information to provide interpretations based on feature function and date ranges of occupation and abandonment. Um, so in a way, kind of testing those hypotheses that Thompson and Pendleton had put forth in their 04 report. And then four, map archeological features and surface artifacts to a common datum and coordinate system, and then integrate that into a GIS database, um, including geo-rectified overlays of the historic maps in the town. And um, some of Josh's slides kind of showed the results of that work. And I'll, have, I'll talk more about that here in a minute as well. Um, so to, to address goals one and three, two previously identified surface features documented by Thompson and Pendleton, um, and located within the main portion of the site were chosen for small scale excavation. And these are features U and V, which you can see on the map here. Um, feature U, a cursor here, and then feature V is this large rectangular feature um, more centrally located uh, within the site. Um, and then that year too, we also tested a third spot. Um, so excavations were opened up near um, a recently discovered looters pit that Northern Land Use Research had noted in 2012. Um, and that's kind of up in this area, northeast of, of Feature V. So we wanted to take a closer look at that. I'm advancing again, there we go. So this is an overview photo of Feature U, which is a rectangular feature measuring seven meters by four and a quarter meters um, and truncated by the gravel road that accesses the wayside. So this photo was taken from up on top of that gravel road. And then this is a, a plan map of the feature that we drew uh, while doing field work in 2014. Um, it shows the road on the left-hand side there and then the six 50 by 50 centimeter test units that we excavated that summer. So in addition to the road that cuts through the south portion of this feature, the upper portions of the, of the stratigraphic profile contained a high gravel content, which likely represents um, disturbance or fill placed on top of the feature, uh, most likely during road construction. So the test units were excavated to an average overall depth of 30 centimeters below surface. And this is just a photo of two of the ASRA students from 2014, Bradley and Zane, getting started in two of the six test units that we excavated in this feature. And here are those same two test units at the base of excavations, which reveal logs um, running in opposite directions, which likely represent uh, 
cabin foundation um, at this location and indicate that at least a portion of this feature remains undisturbed despite the, the road cut and the disturbance with the gravel fill that we noted during excavation. So a total of 153 artifacts were collected from feature U and these include nails, carpet tacks, wood screws, a tar paper fastener, wire fragments, uh, a wood fragment, bottle glass, uh, a piece of plastic, a fragment of paper, fragment of string, and a beer bottle cap, and an insulator fragment. So most of these artifacts are mass produced items, uh, not providing really any contextual information beyond just their basic function. Um, however, the artifact assemblage is consistent with a domestic structure, a family household, which uh, supports Thompson, Thompson and Pendleton's hypothesized um, feature function for feature U. Um, so we do have a few artifacts that can give manufacturing age ranges for the feature. This includes a fragment of a Hemingway Glass Company insulator. So the date we, we retrieved on that or um, researched on that was 1893 to 1950 with a median age of 1922. And then we also found a Coca-Cola bottle, which dated to 1977, as well as a soda cap bottle. Um, that was that plastic artifact that we found uh, dating from 1960 to 2014 with a median age of 1987. So overall for this feature, um, two age ranges, um, two periods of occupation, um, either occupation or incorporation of, of those later artifacts through disturbance. Um, so that early age is consistent with the Chinatown site occupation of 1902 to 1921. And then, um, and then those second uh, later 20th century artifacts from the 70s and 80s, which uh, likely relate to um, use of the area as a wayside. Um, so now I'll give an overview of the work uh, we completed in feature V, again, up in this area here, um, large rectangular feature. And here's our plan view map of that feature. Um, shows a berm all the way around it, um, except it's, it's a little bit undefined on the southern edge there. Uh, but this berm denotes the feature boundaries. And then this map also shows on the seven 50 by 50 centimeter units that we excavated here in 2014. Um, so like I said, this is a really large feature, 21 by 15 meters. Um, and it doesn't appear to have suffered any sort of disturbances. So the noticeable berm outlining this feature, um, again, likely represents the remains of a structural foundation. And, and we placed our test pits across the berm there to try to confirm that idea. Um, and then these are the test pits we excavated to an average depth of just 20 centimeters below surface. Um, several logs were encountered at the base uh, within the berm. And again, likely represent foundational supports for the building that once stood here. Um, and the findings in feature V indicate that it's, um, again, it's intact and um, undisturbed building foundation, which is really great. So we found a total of 75 artifacts from this feature, including bottle glass, um, a moose antler paddle, which you can see in this slide, a metal button, an eye hook, uh, nails, nail segments, um, a can fragment, sheet metal fragments, rodent skull fragments, a blob of solder, strapping and strapping fragments. Um, so this moose antler was found directly outside of the structure. And then several of the clear glass bottle fragments refit. And then we also had an aqua bottle glass fragment that contained an embossed letter A on the bottom. But unfortunately, we haven't been able to tie that to um, being diagnostic as a maker or manufacturer. So no age or really more information. There's a photo of that. Um, bottle base up here in the upper right hand corner. So a majority of the artifacts recovered from this feature again, like feature you they're mass produced items. Um, not really providing much contextual information other than just their basic function and none of the artifacts um, from feature V could be specifically dated, unfortunately, um, as far as 2014 goes. The artifact assemblage collected um, from these seven test units does not offer support for this structure being, or for this feature being a commercial structure, which is what Thompson and Pendleton had hypothesized. Uh, but at the same time, there's nothing um, in the assemblage to argue against that either. So when we wrote the 2014 report up, our conclusion was that we needed more excavation here. Um, 
perhaps from a larger area inside of the structure before we could really make a definitive statement about the feature function um, that's, that was going on here. So all of the artifacts from feature V, while we couldn't date them specifically, they are uh, typical for what you'd expect to find at a site occupied in the early 20th century. So here's an overview of the third and final feature that we tested in 2014, uh, which again may, um, I hadn't said this yet, but it may correspond to Thompson and Pendleton's feature AA or feature BB, uh, which were both labeled as possible privies. And this feature is a circular, it's circular in depression with a berm approximately three meters in diameter. And again, this is where we were seeing the evidence of the looting. Um, this pit here in the center was the remnants of a looter's pit um, right in the middle of the depression there and the, a, surface art of, a surface scatter of artifacts um, that that person had likely found and decided not to collect. Were, um, you can see a, a Rainier can here, but more artifacts were scattered kind of around this northern edge of the feature and then again over on the other side, more on the southern side as well. Um, so in terms of location on Thompson and Pendleton's map, Again, we're northeast of feature V up in this area here. Um, so here's our plan view map for, for this feature where we excavated five 50 by 50 centimeter tests. Um, again, adjacent to the looters pit, which we have mapped in here. And then on this map too, you can also see all these little dots with FS numbers. That's all those surface artifacts, including um, some stove parts that we found on the surface and we'll talk a little bit more about that stove here in a moment. Um, yeah, so test units here were excavated to an average depth of 30 centimeters below surface. And all indications are that this feature was undisturbed outside of that recent looter activity. Um, in this photo, you can really see that after we've been working there for a little while and sort of trample down the vegetation, you can really see the remnants of that pit a little bit better. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the majority of the artifacts that we collected that entire summer in 2014 came from this feature. So 556 artifacts um, were collected from those five 50 by 50 centimeter test units. Um, and those include beer cans, a bone fragment, a boot sole, complete bottles, bottle glass fragments, complete cans, can fragments, a piece of charcoal, metal cup fragments, ceramic cup, saucer, and plate fragments, a fruit pit, a fuel can handle, metal fasteners, those cast iron stove parts um, that I talked about a little bit, and then tar paper as well. Uh, so the bottle glass really included a, a broad mix of, of different colors, including amber, aqua clear, green, medium green, light green, olive green, and manganese decolorized uh, glass fragments were found. And then several pieces of the glass of the green glass refit to form a wine or champagne bottle, uh, but no real markings to help identify the data manufacturer or, or where that bottle came from. And then most of the can fragments were also too small or, or deteriorated to identify, but um, we were able to note that food cans were represented uh, with some of those exhibiting the, the hole, and cap, hole and cap manufacturing technique. Um, <clears throat> So as I mentioned, this uh, feature is possibly one of those designated by Thompson and Pendleton as AA or BB, uh, both of which they hypothesized as privies. So our test excavations revealed this feature um, was most likely the location of a trash dump, um, but, in, but it certainly could have served first as a privy and then became a trash dump later in time. Although there is a, a lack of nails in the feature indicating there was never really a structure over it, again, that um, privy structure could have been moved prior to it becoming uh, a trash pit. So, so the mix of artifacts present here, they're consistent with a dump. But again, I think we need a little bit additional excavation of this feature, um, possibly right close more in the center, more adjacent to the looter's pit to, to get a good idea of whether this was just a trash dump or if it was um, something possibly a privy before it became a trash dump. So. Um, so several of the artifacts that uh, we found in this uh, feature can provide date ranges of manufacture, um, and they're tied to the initial historic occupation at China with median age ranges between 1895 and 1921. So here's a photo of some of those cast iron stove parts. Um, so they all refit, they're all part of the same stove, 
which was stamped with Stoveworks, which refers to the, Detro the Detroit Stoveworks Company, which was founded by Jeremiah and James Dwyer, incorporated in 1864, and then operated until 1924, at, during, at which time it became the Detroit, Michigan Stove Company. So the median manufacturing age for the stove is, is 1898. And then several bottle fragments were pulled out of these test units, um, which also provide date ranges. Um, just one of them's photoed here, the Hannes Distilling Company whiskey bottle um, between 1872 and 1919 with a median age of 1896. Colgate and Company medicine bottle um, dating between 1897 and 1928 with a median age of 1912. A John Lum and Company limited uh, bottle between 1905 and 1937 with a median age of 1921. An Adolphus Bush glass manufacturing bottle, 1908 to 1920, median age 1914. And then a William J. Lemp Brewing Company bottle between 1896 and 1918 with a median age of 1907. Um, and then the that boot sole that we found that I mentioned in that list of artifacts. So the bottom of the boot sole was labeled with a circular marking, Goodyear Rubber Company, Gold Seal, New York, 1872 trademark. Um, so this mark was created by the Goodyear Rubber Company and man manufactured in New York as early as 1905, but with no definitive end date that we've been able to find yet. Um, so overall, these median dates, they kind of skew too young, given that Chino is not established um, until 1902. Um, and therefore the initial occupation of this feature could, should be considered basically the almost the entire um, occupation of China 1902 to 1921 um, this feature was was likely in use again either as a possibly as a Privian trash pit or possibly just as a as a dump so so then um, so again for a majority of the artifacts from this feature we um, don't really provide narrow date ranges, um, even though a lot of them do have unique manufacturing markers um, or markings. Uh, but again, they're still consistent with what you would expect to find at a site occupied in the early 20th century. This slide shows uh, ceramic plate fragments that refit. Um, there's also cup and saucer fragments similar to this from this feature. Um, so they have this distinctive green patterning around the border. Um, and this style of plate was produced in the 1910s by the Johnson Brothers Company founded in England in 1883, and which was still in business as late as 2005. Um, and then additionally, a small number of artifacts from the surface of the feature, um, or at least closer to the surface, um, include aluminum beer cans, a Michelob beer bottle, and a rubber band that indicate a second occupation and later use of this feature and the surrounding area as a trash pit. Um, it might be associated with occupation of the site um, during the oil pipeline boom of the 1970s. So Martin was out there with us in 2014 doing all the mapping. Um, and it's too bad he's not here to talk about his recollection, but he remembered camping out at the wayside in the 70s as a student at UAF, um, just because of housing shortage um, and expensive housing. So his recollection was that people would camp out there in the summer um, during the area of the building of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. So, we're also finding that, that later occupation, uh, which is kind of neat. So now I'll uh, talk about our 2014 GPR survey uh, really quickly. Um, and again, this falls kind of under that second research goal for the site of, of trying to do more GPR work out at the site. So in 2014, we had the help of NLUR again um, with their equipment. And this is Rob Bowman here. Um, who has the expertise to run that equipment, but he was um, nice enough to come out for a day and work with the students to, to set up this grid and run another GPR survey. Um, so they set up this arbitrary grid over this more disturbed central area of the, of the wayside. Um, and here up here is the grid um, that they ran with the GPR. And they found four anomalies um, that they noted out there in 2014. Um, and so these are truncations, and as Josh was kind of talking about, into pretty continuous stratigraphy, presumably alluvial sediments um, from the, the river kind of reworking that, that area, um, either prior to Gina being there or after. Um, so the, the four anomalies show up on this map as um, these four red dots that you can see throughout here. 
Um, and we haven't been able, so there's, there's no um, surface expression for any features out there. So it's possible that these are historic features that relate to the Chena town site, but it's also possible that these are um, just disturbances in that stratigraphy from construction of the wayside um, and might not have anything to do with Chena, but we, we haven't been able to test for that yet. Um, so pouring and augering would probably be the way to do it. Um, but yeah, as of yet, we have, we have not um, explored those four anomalies further. Um, it's definitely on our list of things to do to, to hopefully find out if maybe there's more um, intact historic features there than, um, than what we know about. Um, and then to address goal number four, which uh, was to map archaeological features and surface artifacts um, to a common datum and coordinate system and, and, and then integrate that into a GIS database, again, with geo-rectified overlays of, of maps and photographs. Um, so starting in 2014, um, out there with Martin, we really mapped at the excavation grids and other um, surface cultural material and features along with the GPR surveys to a common grid system um, over the entire area. And then in collaboration with Tom Duncan of Duncan GIS, um, that data has been incorporated into an online GIS mapping system, which this slide is kind of a screenshot of. Um, but that includes version of historic aerial photographs and maps um, And this database is getting periodically updated. Um, as Josh mentioned, we found some more recent um, new archival material. Um, but then as, we, as we've gone out and done more work, um, which I'll talk about our most recent work here in a second, um, all of that survey data is getting um, compiled into the GIS um, and we'll continue to do that throughout the project. Okay, so now I'll move on and talk uh, here about the most recent field work, which was completed just this past summer. It was an archeological um, school run through uh, UAF and so in May of 2021, seven college students um, joined Dr. Justin Cram, who's on the call with us here and will be available at the Q&A session here when I'm done. Um, so Justin's an anthropology professor at UAF. So he ran the six week archeological field school out at the site just this past summer. Um, um, so Josh and I remained involved uh, with planning and helping with the excavation when we could. And then Martin again was out there um, for most of the field school, continuing his role with mapping out the site and teaching students uh, mapping techniques with um, total station and GPS um, techniques. And so I'll run through the 2021 field school pretty quickly because um, it's pretty fresh. Our analysis is still ongoing. Um, and we don't have really fully developed results yet of that project. Um, but also, and I'll touch on this again in a moment, um, Justin's gonna be leading another field school out at the site this next summer, um, which is gonna consist of continuing a lot of the same work that was started um, just this past summer in 2021. So 2021 field work included a, a surface collection of artifacts as well as continued ex excavation in certain areas. We got back into feature V, which in 2014, we had recommended more work there. So, um, so the 2014 excavations were expanded along the east side of the berm and then also um, additional units were placed in the center of this feature as well as along the west wall and then in the southwest corner. Um, and sill logs were uncovered um, and sampled in each of um, each of those contexts. So here's that those test units were placed over the, the southwest corner of that feature, really showing those two um, the actual corner of that building really well, which is which is really great. Um, and then test units um, were placed in transects in the vicinity of feature II, um, again, to test for internal and external artifact densities within those features. So feature II is, um, so this map where feature II is circulated or circled matches up with this map. So it's really far to the northeast portion of the site. Um, where this modern day trail kind of cuts through. So we're um, really far removed from, from other locations that we've tested at the site. Um, so again, feature II, this area is thought to correspond with a possible warehouse in Privy. And so the test units yielded an incredible density of artifacts um, and 
near the hypothesized warehouse, the test units um, yielded barrel hoops and staves, um, which is really great um, in terms of trying to confirm that feature function. And so, um, and then in that same location, the privy test unit yielded. So if you look on the map here, um, this is feature II, which might be that possible warehouse and privy combination. And then the other, I'll talk about this a little bit more here in sort of my concluding slide, but a lot of the features that we've tested are, are sort of in here between state and Wisconsin street, or we're hypothesizing that's where we're at on this historic uh, fire insurance map. So between first and second Avenue, and then between state and Wisconsin for the most part, with feature II just being across the street here. Um, And here's students from the field school analyzing materials, um, again, from the, that feature II area when they were back in the lab this summer. Um, so the privy test unit yielded well-preserved well stratigraphy, metal artifacts, um, ceramics, um, a leather boot, a light bulb base, and glass artifacts, a couple of which are um, on this slide here. And here's one of the boots that we found this past summer, um, which was documented through photographs and description and measuring, um, tracing the soles, um, and then dried out slowly to, to um, just for preservation and curation aspects of it. Um, and then in addition to feature II, we also tested three features out on the more of the main portion of the site. So this is that area where we did the GPR survey in 2014, um, but Josh and I did quick tests in feature C and feature G, which didn't really produce anything. We wanted to get out here and, and um, because of the, the looting that we've seen. So we had the, the looting from 2012 that we tested near in 2014, but when we got back out there this summer, there were a lot more, a lot more um, digging that had been going on um, back in the main portion of the site. So seeing these, are, these features were out in more visible areas, high traffic areas, we decided to test those um, just to see if they really were features or not. Feature C, and G, as recorded by Thompson and Pendleton, um, didn't produce much. But over here in feature B, that was in fact a an historic feature, uh, and we we actually didn't finish the test that we started in feature B, so we covered that, and we'll and we'll be coming back to that um, during the field school next year. Um, and then this leads me to Justin's plug for next summer's field school. Um, again, to continue work at the site. So if you're a student or if you mentor students or if you're just interested and would like to get involved and come out and volunteer for a day or more, uh, please let us know, get in touch with um, Justin and he can tell you um, how, how to get involved out there, how to get students involved um, if you have some that are interested. So. Um, so just to wrap up, this project has been successful in meeting um, at least the archeology span aspect um, in meeting the initial goals that we set uh, but we have yet to be able to really associate any of the features we've tested to known historic structures uh, or um, photographs and maps. Um, so again, trying to trying to um, match up the features that are out there to the actual maps. Um, although I think we're getting a little bit close. So we believe these, most of the features again that we've been testing are the, in the vicinity of Wisconsin and State Street between First and Second Avenue. Um, and as you saw, the, the 1908 insurance map of China doesn't really note any commercial or residential buildings in that area, which is, has made it a little bit difficult, um, except for that warehouse in Privy on the corner of First in Wisconsin, uh, which we think might be feature II. Um, so next summer, we'll certainly look to continue work uh, in that area near feature II with the hope of being able to tie that to an actual spot uh, point on the historic maps, which will be a, a major accomplishment for us. Um, but then also get datable artifacts from that feature and also more artifacts to help us confirm um, the feature function there. And then as we're able to also, we want to continue with the GPR work, hopefully um, do, not only do more GPR survey, but um, try to core and auger those anomalies that we found out in the center of the center of the wayside in 2014 to see if those really are buried historic features or if, or if it's just other um, run of the mill disturbance from construction of the wayside. Um, uh, but then also, again, we'll keep, again, keep feeding all of this new info into, into the GIS, which kind of helps us uh, pull it all, pull it all together, so. 
And then again, as Josh mentioned, I mean, the workout here started before either of us got involved. Um, so this is just a list of everybody I could think of that has contributed to this project. So I just wanted to highlight them, everybody um, who's been involved over the years um, as we continue to try to keep moving this project forward. So that's everything I got. Just stop the share here. Great, thank you, Scott. Really cool work you're doing. Um, sure, thanks. Looks like, looks like neat opportunities in those field schools too. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's great too, that's so close to town. A lot of times you think archeology span field work in Alaska, you've got to- <laughs> Take a helicopter. <laughs> yeah, or just commit several weeks, but it's something where I can, we can go out there and then I can be home at night. So yeah, it's kind of unique in that way too. But. Yeah. Well, we've had some questions come in um, already. I, I encourage you that have questions, you can put them in the chat or if you raise your hand, uh, we can call on you to, uh, to, to say your question out loud. Um, before we get into the questions, Justin, did you have anything you wanna add or are you, you just here for the Q&A? Uh oh, your mic's not working or I can't hear it. How about now? We can hear you now. All right. Uh, no, I just want to say that was great, uh, both Josh and Scott. Um, this has really been a big collaborative project with a lot of people over the years working on different aspects of it. And we're just trying to do justice to the archaeology out there and uh, do the best we can to help tell the story of China. Um, Justin, you put your email um, up, but you only sent it to the host and panelists. So if you want, oh, I'm sorry. Um, you, want, you might want to um, adjust that in the chat. I will. I'll put that back in. Thank you. Right. So I will. Um, it looks like some of these questions are just uh, general, uh, not necessarily focused for either one of you, but uh, I'll let you guys decide who wants to answer. Um, the first one comes from Ron Inoue. He asks, uh, have there been artifact comparisons between China and Fairbanks? What does an English origin signify? Uh, more highly keepsake versus function U.S. version. I don't think we've gotten to that point yet. Uh, we're still getting a sample from China. And when I talk about a sample, there's been very little excavation compared to like the Barnett Street excavations that Pete Bowers did in, in Northern Land Use. And uh, they actually looked at commodity flow between different artifacts, not only international artifacts through different gateways of like San Francisco, San Francisco and New York and uh, sort of things like that. So uh, we're not really to that point yet, but that is definitely something that we've been thinking about. And Robin Mills is actually a collaborator on this um, also. And so once we get a larger sample of artifacts and artifact types and can relate them to the origin of where they were manufactured, then we can start looking at that. But it's, it's a little ways down the line, <laughs> I guess. still muted eric I'm the moderator i can't get that <laughs> right man um uh from david ramser uh why would those sites be looted is there a market for those types of artifacts um there is a market i mean for certain types of things but then also just there's a lot of people out there that like collect historic bottles or different types of historic artifacts i mean i think that's I think that's more the draw as opposed to people finding things and selling it. It's more people adding to their personal collections. That's just kind of my personal feelings on it. I don't know if Josh has more insight or Justin, but. Yeah, there's been a rise in it with sort of these reality TV shows and metal detection and these sort of YouTube videos. And so we've noticed that, that there's been really a rise at these, these historic sites uh, with, um, that sort of activity as you have these sort of independent YouTube shows too. So they've been sort of tracking that at agencies and things like that, but it, 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 yeah, for us at the museum, it's sort of understanding the, um, how we can actually, uh, get 
to people and have them actually help us find things and things like that. So, uh, so sort of do collaborations with in interested detectorists, I guess you would call them. Great, thanks. Um, a question from Colleen Bridge, and I, um, this, this may have to be uh, a little bit more specific. Well, it, she asked about erosion, and it looks like there's a lot of erosion. Is there a way to quantify the amount of erosion you see? Yeah, so I think that's where Bob Henze might be going with some of the studies. And it, it's really neat that you actually have this sort of historical series of of uh, photograph, aerial photographs very early on, even in um, history of um, aerial overflights of that area. So uh, that would be really a question for Bob uh, Henze. And, um, but in having a geological background, I think you can do that, especially with the work that we're actually doing. Uh, I think Andy Higgs may have had a question here. Was there any evidence of past uh, river overbank flooding? And so through the actual on the ground work that we're doing with the, what we'd call the geoarchaeology side of it, digging test pits and looking at sedimentation rates and things like that, we can see uh, flooding events after China in certain areas potentially, and, and also the erosion during certain times, if we can actually quantify that in time. So we can use that with Bob Henze's work on the, the GIS part and sort of look at the, the difference between erosion uh, across the site in sedimentation through time and sort of maybe quantify it in um, sort of rudimentary terms and quantification, not, not, not necessarily what you'd get in the studies that they've been doing in the China River flood bank studies, but um, w w that's, that's sort of a, a long-term goal, I think, if that answers the question. <laughs> Yeah, let me know if there's a follow-up, Colleen. Um, and uh, you sort of addressed Andy's question there. Um, any, anything else you want to say on that in your testing? Was there any evidence of past, past river overbank flooding in the sediment profiles? Um, we've debated this actually this year. We had a, a area that me and uh, Scott started on and there looks like there may be evidence of, of some uh, floods after the hiatus of a uh, China town site. So we can actually see sand being deposited on these, these features and burying them. Uh, the question is, is, is now timing um, on those features and if we can actually see and sort of, uh, capture in time when that flooding actually was. Was it 1967 uh, or was it earlier than that? And there's definitely floods. You can actually see them in some of the historic photos before the 1967 flood that actually went, um, carried sediment on, on parts of these sites, so. And I'll just add to that, um, that what Josh was talking about was that feature C that we tested, which is right along I mean, it's just steps away from the modern day riverbank there. I don't mm -hmm. think that we've noticed any flooding on top of historic features more further back um, in the main portion of the site. So this is sort of closer to the river that, mm -hmm. that, that we're seeing that, but not so much as of yet further, further away from the river. So. Thanks guys. The, the next question is for Scott and it's from Angie Schmidt. Uh, what you found so far is pretty neat. What objects do you really wish you would have found at the site but didn't? Or what do you think you might yet uncover through further excavations? Um, well, with feature V, I mean, it'd be really great to find, I guess in terms of like, I mean, it's been great with the, the datable things that we've been able to find so far, but in terms of determining feature function, it'd be nice to, um, be able to excavate in a feature and find something oh this is definitely was a warehouse or this was definitely x function or resident a resident so so i guess finding more artifacts that'll help us sort of tie function to these features to say what what people were doing in them and what function they were serving um, when the town site was there would be more interesting to me to find to find more of and i don't know justin could probably speak more to what 
was found in feature V um, this past summer. If there was anything in there that would have indicated that was what was going on with that feature. I know it was hypothesized as a warehouse, just given the size of it. And I know what we found in 2014 didn't really match up with that partially because we were excavating right over the, the wall of the feature, but. Yeah, um, I don't know that we have anything that we can, you know, definitively say is diagnostic of a, a warehouse in that in that particular feature. I mean, we did pull some some lighting fixtures and a lot of a lot of melted glass, a lot of nails, um, some things that had to do with um, uh, like a portion of uh, of a horse hoof that may have been, um, you know, they may have been chewing animals in and around that area. Um, I'm really not um, really not sure that we can speak to the function with what we've done right now. Yeah, so that's really what I would. And again, getting getting datable artifacts for each feature is great too. Um, so just things that you can tie to dates and then things you can tie to function, but not necessarily any specific artifact or item that, that I have in mind that I would enjoy finding personally, but yeah. All right, the next question is from uh, Theodore Craig. Do you have a goal for final preservation of the site? I think well, I know a... at one point we talked, well, Josh mentioned getting interpretive panels, but also having sort of an interpretive trail out there. Um, another kind of goal is just sort of raising the profile so more folks in the community know that that's out there um, and hopefully to, to kind of prevent or slow down the looting that we've seen. I know in 2014, we there wasn't, I think we'd only known about two looters pits and then there were significantly more when we went out last summer. I mean, granted, we'd, we hadn't really worked out there for, um, for seven years, but we'd been out there off and on, but it seemed like there was a lot more of that type of activity. Um, so again, trying to raise the profile so um, people know not to go out there to do that type of activity. Yeah, and partly I think the it's really as as we're trying to get at it, is this sort of raising the profile to have it as as community input as much as we can, and really the preservation is going to come partly from the parks because they're the management, but also what the community wants and raising that uh, those interests and and what they want to see. Um, sort of out of this project as far as kiosks there's actually there was a building that was moved over there and the parks are actually uh, so it was an old china building that was actually moved to lad field and then it was at jim moody's place and it was moved back to china and so there's this ongoing sort of um trying to get things out there that would sort of get people interested in china again but also almost a community policing of the activities out there as far as like looting and things like that because the parks the parks just doesn't have all of the manpower to do that and um so as we raise the profile that's sort of the hope that the community responsibility for preservation is is the way to go in the long run next question is from melissa chapin uh, what is the status of the native village site and is it accessible for archaeology study? Yeah, so I think that that uh, it's actually on maybe an allotment um, and um, you know that the question of accessibility for archaeological study and um, is, is really one for not only the traditional councils that um, um, are or sort of, um, they're the ones that actually say if, if it's open and what actually happens for archeological study, we, uh, TCC also. Um, and we, with this project this year, we've gotten in touch with TCC and Doyon and, and uh, at, down in Ninana, the traditional council down there and really made outreaches so we could have people uh, know that we're actually at the town site, but also having different input of of, of different communities that were actually connected to the town site all the way down to Rampart was one of those communities that was connected to the town site. Uh, Chena Village was near there. So trying to get more input on our studies, just not from the point of view of Chena itself and Fairbanks, but also these outlying communities that were connected. 
Um, but there, there, as far as I know, there's been no archaeological study at the town site at, or the village site itself. And that, that would be a question for the traditional councils and the corporations. Uh, the next question is from Andy Higgs. Do you know if there were any cemeteries associated with the Chena town site, um, i.e. shown on the maps? Andy, with all, always with the cemeteries, Andy. Um, yeah, so uh, this was one that, uh, talk about community collaboration, Joni Skilbred, who's a, a local historian who may be on here, um, actually keyed us into, there's a couple burials that are up farther up on the hill uh, we don't know of any real cemeteries within the town site itself, and she's done, she's probably one of the foremost experts on interior cemeteries. Um, so she has actually been helping us with sort of uh, understanding if there's actual burials out near there, so we can actually be uh, pretty respectful about if we're running into things, um, but we don't know of anything within the town site proper. There's a couple where uh, where uh, it's called, it was called Hopkinsville, which was sort of over Ross Slough and over toward the bluff. And it was a, um, a, hot, a boundary where Hopkins had had some land and the, the burials were actually on their land up on the sort of the bluff up there close to the bluff edge. So we do know where a couple burials are, but not a proper cemetery. No. This is Karen. Actually, I have a question. It's sort of a two-parter. Um, Scott, you were talking about the privy, um, whether it's a privy or whether it was a dump. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that um, in Skagway, Kathy Spooty did uh, archaeological work of the of a privy that was full of trash. I mean, it, that's it got used that way, kind of afterwards or during or whatever. So I don't know. Is it mm -hmm. possible that? your dump is a privy and a dump at the same time. Well, that's the feeling that I have, yeah. I mean, it, it likely was. Um, but yeah, that's a very good point off to look at that work from Skagway. But yeah, it certainly wouldn't be surprising. And that's sort of the direction we're, we're leaning in with that too. Yeah, it was, it was a, um, Father Terrell, I think was his name. He was a, a local um, priest there and they found lots of things thrown down that privy hole. <laughs> when it was yeah, a, well, I've always heard. I haven't done a lot of historic archaeology, but I always hear that's where you find the good stuff is in the privies. So. Yeah, and yeah, and at the other end of the site, we have another privy deposit that's showing the same trend. So it's a, uh, it's definitely a privy, but we also have a lot of you know domestic refuse thrown into that, uh, into that area. Yeah, and in in her case, I think there were. I think it's the same site. I can't remember, but. That there were things thrown down there that you wonder if they were thrown down you know to hide them mm -hmm. you know oh. were, you know it was a priest and there were liquor bottles kind of thing um <laughs> so it would be interesting to compare and i was also thinking the comparison with dai and the town old town site of dai and how the park service has kind of you know brushed that out and you can see the grid of the old streets and they have interpretive signs and you know, they have the one false front, but, you know, which you wouldn't have for the, well, you do have the building that was moved there, uh, but there's an example of kind of uh, interpretive signs and being able to reimagine that place through by walking around. Yeah, one of the things I should mention is we're working with Miho at the UAF Art Department to try and, uh, as best as we can, reconstruct a couple of things, 3D modeling um, historic photos. And she's done that with um, with uh, Fairbanks, actually downtown Fairbanks. Uh, and so taking as many photos that we can and actually making a virtual 3D space, uh, not necessarily walking actually in the town, but you can move these photos and sort of orient them um, in 3D. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. She put the link up about Father Tunnell's pit. Uh, Park Service, she knows all about those reports. So thanks. And cool. then there's a question from Bill Schneider. Eric. Yeah. So uh, Bill put in uh, Have you looked at the native cemetery at Howard's Camp? 
Uh, no, I mean, a lot of that is, is away from the town site proper. And um, that's uh, Howard Luke has actually had other, I think other uh, anthropologists and, and archeologists over there just, um, and that's, that's something we, we haven't done. No. And there's an, uh, another question from Hild Peters. She's mm -hmm. she's still confused as to where the Chena was located. Uh, is it on the Chena Pump Road past the pump house? Yes, that is. Yeah, yes. past the pump house, right before you go up to the bluff to get up on Chena Ridge or to cut down into Rosie Creek area. Yeah, well, the wayside is what used to be the Chena uh, campground. It's now the Chena Pump Wayside right before you go up the hill on Chena Pump Road. So those were all the questions in the chat. We still have a few minutes left. If anyone wants to raise their hand or if you still have questions, let me know. And uh, also if the panelists have anything else they wanna to add, uh, feel free to take the platform. I would just reiterate the idea that if you want to get involved, um, let us know, particularly, I mean, we're going to be out there again next summer. So come out and visit us if you're so inclined and help us dig and screen. And looks like Hill just had a follow up uh, to her question about where the site is located. Um, people have settled around that area and how does that impact the future of a historic site? Yeah, that, I mean, that's one, you know, thing that we're trying to get at is that, um, you know, that we have the China town site era that, you know, 1901 to 1920, but the air, the landscape there or that specific location has been used for a long, long time. And, and so we're actually trying to get at how people were using them in the 1950s to the impact on uh, you know the the building of the wayside or the campground in the 1960s, and as people have uh, built around on China Pump Road uh, and all those other areas, how is that impacting it? And that that's sort of a question that we have continually going, especially you know during COVID, we actually see saw a lot more activity out there over the spring and and some interesting behaviors I might add to. Um, it, some erratic behaviors that we didn't actually anticipate. And so those, that's always an ongoing question, I think, of how people using the area is, um, is going to impact the site. The question is, is how we actually um, mitigate those impacts. And that, that's sort of a question, I think, for the community that, that um, this site is significant to. Um, so that, that's, that's really, it's sort of an agency question and a community question. And so that's why we sort of started this project in the first place. Well, yeah, the construction of China Pump Road right there, that would be a huge impact. Yeah, it, it was, yeah. And as Scott pointed out, there's a feature out there that we know that was impacted by it. There's gravel in there. And then also the, you know, as we point out though, Martin, you know, we find these, these uh cans that are dating to the pipeline and we we kid martin about being out there as a squatter because he actually <laughs> was out there because he couldn't get lodging so you know all of this use out there is is interesting to us for this project and it's also interesting you know bob henzi just brought up to me uh, when he gives sort of his flood and um historic flooding uh presentation that everybody has a story about it that lives out there and so we want to sort of record these things you know and this feeds into our preservation plans for it so um ron in a way had his hand raised and i given him permission to speak so ron um go ahead thanks i think that there's an interesting proposition too dealing with how we manage the water flow over the years I think about the dam system to, you know, keep the Tananaw in the Tananaw and China mm -hmm. from flooding in Fairbanks. So mm -hmm. that massive dam system through Moose Creek altered a lot of things. And then they dragged 
the china so that the riverboat could get through so there have been mm -hmm. a lot of alterations just in our contemporary memory and i don't know how that may or may not have affected but i think there are a lot of factors like that that are human induced as well as what happens naturally and it certainly makes things much more complex for you folks I was just wondering if there was an isolated sort of ghost town where you think there needs to be excavation that hasn't been affected by a lot of close by human contact. I just think that the we've had stories about ghost towns and places that mm. are now deserted that were pretty significant and haven't really subsequently been altered much. But they are certainly a part of our history and you know as the climate changes we just see a continuation of that the change mm -hmm. and the loss of that material, or in some cases, perhaps the preservation of it too, it depends on how, how the land settles or morphs. Any opinions? Yeah, I mean, finding an intact site that hasn't had any disturbances is pretty hard now because we've had so many, you know, sprawling areas or we have had you know, advocational archaeologists um, that have gone or, or detectors have gone to these sites that have disturbed some of it, or we have mining act continual mining activity at these sites. I mean, this was this is a mining town, and and uh, you know that that's a continual activity in some of these areas. So um, it gets hard to find really pristine intact stuff. Is as we were just talking before this with Eric, you know, um, about that. Um, and so, yeah, it'd be really nice. Uh, the other thing is, uh, is just the accessibility that we can actually do these projects. And China is one of those that we can actually get students out there. And so the feasibility of it is, is, is what we're looking at also, I think. And there, there, there was other urban archeology span happening. Um, uh, there's a lot in the nineties that happened actually. Andy Higgs is on here and he did a lot of that and Pete Bowers and others. Um, the Barnett Street project is one or the projects up toward um, up toward north of Fairbanks that that they were doing. Um, but yeah, thanks for tackling the urban archaeology question from Angie. We only have a couple minutes left. Somebody asked uh, uh, about old metals. Boy. I have no idea about that one. Yeah, I don't know much about old metals, unfortunately. Let us know if you know anything about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another question that came in was, how much has your funding been cut in the last 10 years? Um, do we really want to get into that? Or do <laughs> we, uh, Just say a lot. <laughs> okay. The Karen said it for us, so. <laughs> we're still kicking though luckily not as much as the governor wanted or let's cut be, that uh... out though <laughs> I, I guess maybe be, how do you fund your work do you get grant funding or are you funded just through the museum as regular parts of your jobs kind of more the latter i mean the at the azra the azra program that yeah we've We've done that. I mean, it, I don't know if the Azra program's gonna, gonna be back, but that's a program that we took part in for probably 10 years straight almost um, and went to different sites around. So that was sort of funded through grants. So that gave us kind of the student work, but then also, yeah, um, Josh and I would kind of volunteer our time or just incorporate that into our, our work here at the museum, yeah. And then with the field school last year, that's sort of part of Justin's job through through UAF running field school. So, well, we're we're near the end here. Um, there's a minute left. I, I want to thank the the presenters for for uh, for coming on today. And it's it's neat to have some overlap with the archaeologists. I, I keep thinking it'd be neat to collaborate our our meetings with the little triple A uh, little triple A's one of these years, um, but really neat work you guys are doing um and yeah i don't know if you guys have any final comments but uh, uh appreciate you appreciate what you did today thanks eric thanks for moderating and just thanks to everybody for 
for being here and for all the great questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having us.